I'm Steve Orleans, president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by my friend Chung Li. Uh, I should say good morning to those in the United States and good evening to those in Asia, where Chung Li is actually in, uh, in Singapore. Uh, I'm thrilled to have him join us, not only because he's a great friend, because we've just witnessed the conclusion of the 20th Party Congress, and Chung is the leading American expert on Chinese leadership. He is the director of the John L. Thornton China Center at Brookings uh, and a director of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and an incredible supporter of the committee. I don't want to use any time to talk about all of his publications and the innumerable media appearances that he has had in the last four days since the conclusion of the party Congress. But let's turn it over to Chung um, for a discussion. Then I'll ask some questions. Then I'll take audience questions. I apologize in advance. We already have 40 questions, so I will not be able to get to all of them. But Chung, take it away. Well, thank you, uh, Steve, and uh, thank you for the, all the participants. I'm honored to speak uh, uh, for this great audience. I have a PowerPoint. Let me first turn on the PowerPoint. And um, um, okay, could you see it, Steve? Yes. Okay, good. Now, uh, when Steve and I uh, plan this uh, event, and um, um, you know, uh, his staff asked me the the, the title. I uh, actually the title is was my children that are beyond the surprises. Given the opaque nature of the leadership transition this time, I think definitely there will be so so many surprises. And also one uh, important phenomenon related to opaque na nature is different people have different expectations, including myself. So I think that we are certainly in the situation that will be surprises and sometimes uh, surprise, but also. Uh, sometimes uh, confused or, 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 or all kind of feelings. So um, in today's um, presentation, I will cover uh, four uh, topics. Uh, each of them start with a P uh, for better memories for, for this audience. Start with the perplexities and could be surprises as well. Then secondly, I will uh, focus on personnel and talk about some of the paradoxes based on the, the appointment. And finally, I will talk about uh, government uh, priorities, the new leadership priority, or more precisely, uh, how that the personnel uh, uh, appointments reflect Xi Jinping's priorities. Now, uh, before that, uh, talk about this four topic, I want to use one minute uh, to give the structure things because not uh, all the audience uh, are familiar with, of course, most of them are, but the things that some students, uh, college students in this audience, I think I want to share with that. Now, uh, now the, there's altogether about the 97 million of Chinese Communist Party members, almost 100 million. Now 200, uh, 2,296 people participated in the National, uh, National Party Congress. This does not include uh, the so-called uh, special guests, uh, invited uh, delegates, uh, 86 people, including Fu Jintao and, uh, uh, and the many senior leaders. And also then, then select the 376 uh, members, including 205 full members and 171 alternates, similar, just so, uh, switch one full members, uh, you know, one alternate member to four members this time. Last time it was uh, 205 full members and 172 alternate members. Now, Power Bureau, there's an interesting job for one person, and now it's 24. And of course, the most important uh, things is the Power Bureau Standing Committee, uh, seven. And uh, so, certainly, this is, will be the the, the, the focus of this discussion. And the, finally, General Secretary Xi Jinping himself. Now, uh, this is the, uh, the data I just uh, completed a couple of days ago with a lot of work, you can imagine, that uh, the, in the Central Committee, there's a still very high turnover rate, about uh, 246 are new members, yellows are new members, about 65%. And also the, the, um, the Disciplinary Commission, it's very much anti-corruption uh, body, it's also about 64% the new members. And um, the secretary, the seven members, this is the organization in charge of daily um, activities in the party and the government establishment. So it's so 100% all new. And the actually last party Congress is also uh, all new members for the, uh, the secretary. And the uh, power bureau, uh, more than half are new. Uh, this is what I uh, predicted. 
and uh, 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 so so about the fifty four percent. Now, Power View Standing Committee is four out of seven are uh, first timers, and the Military Commission seven member and the three are new, and uh, so less than fifty percent. But the, later I will mention the in terms of all sixty six military members in the Central Committee, actually turnover rate is also is very very high, much higher than that. Now, this is not entirely new. The high turnover rate. If we uh, do not, uh, if we count those from alternate to four member, this is the way the Chinese did. Uh, it's all on average, it's sixty two percent. You know, every party Congress. Now, if we delete that from alternate to uh, four member, usually about roughly ten to twelve percent uh, less. So, last party Congress, seventy five percent new members, and it's really quite remarkable. This time, it's the third highest. Is also pretty high. Now, this is the the Central Committee. So my point is, actually, the generational change is is underway. Actually, there's the uh, I have some charts because the time can I will not share. There's no member in both four and altered, um, uh, uh, born after 1980, but uh, uh, the majority, 80 percent or more, because I still need to double check. Still, there are 12 people out of these 300. 376, their, their uh, age or other information are not uh, uh, open to the public yet, but I think within a few days, I will know better. So basically, the generation change is underway, but not for the eighth generation. It's usually uh, uh, dominated by sixth generation. And also that uh, uh, around the seven to 10% are uh, seventh generation born the 1970s. Now, uh, these are, of course, the previous uh, uh, Power Bill Standing Committee. Three people remain, and uh, four people and en uh, enter. So this is the the top seven. This is the, got a lot of attention, and I will uh, also give some kind of analysis or comment. Now these are the uh, although it's not formally announced, but this is most likely. Uh, there are other positions. Li Chang will be premier. Zhao Leji will be the chairman of the MPC, ranking number three. And uh, Wang Funying uh, will be um, the, uh, the CPPCC, the chairman. And the Tsai Chi will uh, take over Wang Funying's previous position, become executive secretary of the secretary. And, um, and Ding Xuexiang, actually very interesting, will be executive vice premier of the state council. Now these are expected, but uh, Li Xi is already clear that he is in the CCDI, the Central, Mil Central Commission for Discipline Inspection. Now, so uh, that's the, the top, uh, seven. Now, the most important things I want to share with you, then go to these four, four, four uh, P's, is that uh, uh, really drastic change of Xi Jinping uh, 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 consol uh, I mean, consolidated power in a dramatic way. Now, in the first term, now this is his third term, in the first term, he largely ran the country through his political allies, you know, the, the, the middle column, Zhang Dejiang, uh, Yu Zhengsheng, Wang Jisan, and Zhang Gaoli. These are not Xi Jinping's men, but these are Jiang Zemin's protégés. So they support Xi Jinping. Now also there's a two uh, uh, Xi Jinping's potential rivals, uh, Li Keqiang and Liu Yunshan. They both advanced their career from Chinese Communist Youth League. Although uh, Liu Yunshan's identity is sometimes also very close to Xi Jinping. But uh, again, Xi Jinping uh, did not have his own protégés. Now we know the difference between protégés and allies. Protégés are the people uh, you promoted and they show you, uh, loyalty to you. Now, certainly the second term, Li Zhansu and uh, Zhao Reji are largely, their rise to the top leadership are largely attributed to Xi Jinping's uh, you know, uh, support. And also two uh, people from Shanghai, mm -hmm. uh, Wang Funying and Han Zheng, uh, largely you know, through Shanghai connection and uh, Zhang Zemin. And also three, uh, two Chinese Communist Youth League, we call them Tuan Pai. Li Keqiang and Wang Yang, they are the ones career from Chinese companies usually. Now this third term is quite remarkable. There's no um, you know, potential rival. And uh, Wang Funying is the only one, it's, a, it's a not a, like a protege, it's a political ally. As we know that the, uh, uh, Wang Funying is, is never seen as a threat to Xi Jinping. And, uh, but uh, the five other uh, power of standing committee members are all Xi Jinping's protege. They work with Xi Jinping under Xi Jinping in some cases for 30 years, in some cases for 10 to 15 years. So that's the, that's the uh, profound change in terms of in Xi Jinping's favor, in terms of his consolidation of power. He dominated uh, 
this uh, most important leadership body, he and his protege. Now, let me talk about perplexities. perplexities. I have five surprises. I just finished an article uh, with Brookings this morning. The first surprise is that I know that the women's uh, representation will be, uh, will be very small tribute, but I never thought that there would be no single woman. This is uh, the first time in 25 years, you know, I will be happy to comment. Uh, no one in the Power Bureau, only these 11 women uh, made it to the full uh, membership of the uh, 20th century committee. It's about the five to 4%. You no, know? so that's the, uh, the, the women leaders and uh, the kinship, the absence of the Power Bureau member, which is quite a surprise to me. The second surprise is the absence of the Tuan Pai leaders. Tuan Pai is the, those leaders advance their career from the Chinese Communist usually, uh, usually uh, rank, uh, which is started by Hu Yaobang, later by Hu, uh, Hu Jintao and Li Keqiang, and then also Hu Zhenghua served as the top leader. Now, I was not surprised Li Keqiang and Wang Yang. If you look at my comments in the past four months, I always believe these two people will uh, step down, partly because of age, and uh, partly because you know uh, uh, Xi Jinping wants to vacate, uh, give more seats to younger leaders. But of course, I was astonished to see that Hu Zhenghua did not make it to the Power Bureau Standing Committee, but also did not make it to the Power Bureau. I think in the next uh, uh, few days and a few weeks, we may know more answer to that, uh, that uh, really incredible story. So that's a surprise to me. Not so, not so much about Li Keqian and Wang Yang did not make it to the Power Bureau Standing Committee, but uh, Hu Zhenghua could not enter this time. The, as we know, that um, Chinese Communist Youth League officials that, Tuan Pai leaders occupied a lot of seats. Look at the, the 18th uh, Power Bureau, Xi Jinping's first term, there are six. And uh, uh, second term reduced to three, and this time none, none. Now, of course, that the uh, uh, princeling, that the people that the, come from prominent family background also reduced. So after Xi Jinping uh, relatively control or, or Diminish the influence of Tuan Pai. He also keep a distance from from um, princelings. So also from the nine in the eighteenth power bureau at that time, really Tuan Pai and the princeling share the power or balance each other. Then reduced to four, the last power bureau now only three, and uh, 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 Xi Jinping and Zhang Yuxia. Now Wang Yi is the son in law of the uh, Mi Su for the Wang Lai, also the former ambassador you know, to Geneva. Usually, ambassador also considered as a high-ranking official. So these are the three uh, princelings. Now, this is not only in the, uh, the Power Bureau, but also look at the Central Committee. This is also the number I just completed. It's an inclusive because I still need to double check, you know, three or four people, but it's largely it's accurate. You see the drastic decline of Tuan Pai, also significant decline of the uh, uh, princelings that the uh, um, blue color is the, the, uh, the four member and the yellow color is alternate. So this is the, the reduced to insignificant, but actually in two, 10 years ago, Tuan Pai occupied so many seats. And this is the legacy of, of Hu Jintao. 96, um, 96 is about 23%. It's a really significant one faction occupied so many uh, important seats. Now certainly significantly dropped. Now the, the nurse surprise three, is a uh, premier designate, you know, um, Li Keqiang uh, previously did not serve as vice premier. That's actually never happened before in the 77 years in the PRC history, except that Zhou Lai, the first premier, all other premiers, including Hua Guofeng, of course, Zhao Ziyang, all previously served as a vice premier, but Li, Li Chang was a surprise. Li Chang was also surprised that uh, <laughs> Uh, that uh, the cover he become a controversial -ish figure that the people in Shanghai remember, um, you know, in, in March or April, think his career, political career is over. But uh, not only over, he moved to the Power Bureau Standing Committee. That's actually what I expected. But to become premier, I never thought that would be the case. Xi Jinping certainly used a lot of capital. But I hear there's two important messages, maybe three. One is that uh, um, cover uh, lockdown in Shanghai was not a failure, it's a success. So that's tell you about uh, the top leadership review, especially Xi Jinping's views. And also it's a very clear message to other leaders in the, across the country that uh, Li Chang got promoted because he carried out you know, uh, 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 the Zhong Nanhai's order. And also another thing is that Li Chang, this is things that uh, 
uh, you will see a lot in the coming um, months that Li Qiang has been a very important uh, economic uh, administrator in local level from Zhejiang, Jiangsu, and Shanghai. And most people think that he's uh, uh, business friendly. You know, I was in Taiwan, uh, Taipei, uh, just yesterday. Actually, I arrived in Singapore today. That uh, most of the Taiwanese business people think Li Chang is very market friendly. Uh, uh, also, know Taiwan, what's going on in Taiwan, uh, reasonably well because he's a previous experience. So there's different messages uh, that uh, uh, some people will be disappointed, continue to be disappointed. Some people are very cynical. Some people. Uh, also think that it's very good for business and etc. And also we should not forget that a few years ago that uh, I actually wrote that in my middle class Shanghai, he opened the factory, the auto factory for you know, Tesla, really dramatically changed the China's uh, US trade. So that's uh, certainly whether Xi Jinping asked, uh, give him a chance to do it or he initiated that, we do not know, but uh, that's the, the, uh, the premier. But uh, still I'm astonished a uh, uh, premier designate without previous experience. This is another surprise. Now the fourth surprise is the, is the two top military uh, leaders, vice president, vice chairman of CMC. I mean, neither uh, of them is very much expected. For Zhang Yuxia, he is really um, you know, a, a similar age and same age as Li Zhansu, the oldest member uh, in, now in the Central Committee. I mean, people most think that people he will step down and but the uh, he still remain. And, uh, but uh, I think there's two uh, important reasons Xi Jinping uh, probably justify his remain when it's about Taiwan, because he has been in charge of Taiwan affair. And uh, it, secondly, is military modernization. He previously served the equivalent uh, director of the equivalent department. And also that uh, actually he was not so hawkish in the, in the warfare. He constantly said that the Chinese military should be disciplined and, uh, and follow the order of the century. Uh, the CMC. So in that regard, it's not necessarily a hawkish person. But the other one, He Weidong, it's really a, a promoter like a two or three steps out of nowhere, people can say. But the reason he's appointed that he uh, was the commander of the Easter Operation Theater, so directly in charge of Taiwan warfare preparation. So this is clearly related with Taiwan issue. Now, uh, the important thing is that, as I mentioned earlier, that the military leadership turnover is really quite striking. So um, it's about 85%. I cannot see my screen because I need to adjust it. Maybe I can see it. Yeah, and uh, it's 85%. And uh, this is actually really just meaning that the military uh, 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 leaders, represent representatives in the Central Committee, altogether 66. I still need to double check a couple of people, uh, uh, their full identity, but it's roughly the, this number. This is also the same number uh, five years ago, uh, but uh, uh, five years ago, the turnover even higher, it's 91%. This one is 85%. Both are very, very high. Even during the crisis, like Lin Biao, like uh, Young Brothers, the turnover rate is about uh, 40 uh, and a little bit more than 40, but uh, you can see that uh, uh, that means that Xi Jinping promote of young, military guards and also uh, the, the turnover last time and this time very, very fast. Xi Jinping promoted a lot of military technocrats into uh, this important body. Uh, I have some reason, some, okay. The last surprise is the two youngest Power Bureau standing committee members are both in the state council as premier designate and executive vice premier designate based on what my previously widely circulated uh, in China, the version Deng Xuexiang will be, uh, although it's not 100% certain, uh, nevertheless, he is currently considered by many medias, I mean, social medias in China, a lot of versions, he is uh, taking uh, Han Zhen's position. Now, it's uh, fascinating to see that I always wonder how Xi Jinping uh, uh, deal with the issue, possible successor, because if you have the two leaders, I mean, the next day, domestic and international uh, will say these are the two successors. One success him as uh, you know, general secretary or president and president. The other will be the next, you know, after five years, the premier will continue or new premier. But the fascinating thing is if we put these two people in the same, I mean, state council, actually no one predicted uh, these two will be uh, uh, successors. This is fascinating to see uh, that kind of arrangement. You know, so this is another surprise. Now, 
having said that, the surprise is, of course, that the, you know, Hu Jintao's the episode, it's, it's actually it's not surprise, it's, it's astonishing. It's really show um, a, a PR disaster. No, I will not comment now. But on the other hand, I did predict very well in terms of who will step down largely and who will enter as a new, um, new members of Power Blue Standing Committee. Now, this is the article I wrote 10 days before the announcement at the Brookings web uh, site. The title is She's uh, Three Difficulties. In that uh, uh, article, I predict uh, these eight are the top contenders for the Power Blue Standing Committee. Three are belong to the early born 19, you know, early 1950s uh, or middle 1950s, sorry. But the other five are so-called sixth generation born in 1960s or 1959, it's very close. But uh, of course you see four people indeed made it to the Power Blue Standing Committee. Uh, this is including Li Xi, Cai Qi, Ding Xuexiang, and of course Li Qiang. Now two other, Chen Ming'er and uh, Ma Xinri made it to the Power Bureau, it's one check. And uh, Hu Tenghua mysteriously could not make it, make it. Now let me talk about personnel, I think that uh, uh, in addition to what I said early on. Now, this is the things that uh, uh, most of people, it's again, not to confirm uh, in the Power Bureau, uh, you know, you, if we 24, you minus seven, there's a 17. Uh, these are the very, very important leaders, particularly for the future. And uh, Ma Xinri probably will stay as a Xinjiang party secretary. And uh, Wang Yi will be replacing Yang Jiezi. And uh, uh, Ying Li, uh, previously uh, Fu Jian party secretary will move to Tianjin. Uh, and also Si Taifeng, the former colleague of the Central, uh, Central Party School, uh, will become the head of the organization department. And uh, Liu Guozhong and Xi Jinping's friend in Shanxi and, uh, 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 will become Chongqing Party Secretary. And uh, Li Ganjie will take a very, very important position, formerly Shandong Party Secretary, become director of CCP General Office, replacing Ding Xuexiang. And uh, Li Sulei is, uh, uh, will become propaganda uh, czar. And previously, he was also number two person in Central uh, Party School. And Li Hongzhong will move to become number two person in the MPC. And uh, He Weidong, I already mentioned military. So Li Feng, Xi Jinping's longtime friend in Fujian, will become vice premier of the state council. And Zhang Yuxia, I already mentioned. Uh, Zhang Guoqing will move to Guangdong, become uh, uh, replace Li Xi. And, uh, Chen Wenqing, I mean, Chen Wenqing is a person who previously is the head of China's intelligence and now become, uh, will become secretary of the Commission of Political Science and the Law. And uh, actually very interesting, Chen Jinying will not be the Beijing party secretary, will be the Shanghai party secretary. And another vice premier is Chen Ming'er and uh, also that the Yuan Jiajun will uh, go to Beijing, the Beijing party secretary. The third vice premier will be Wang Kunming. So that's the, again, it's not finalized and uh, could be some minor changes, but that's the version that uh, I think is quite credible. Now, I, let me mention very quickly mention uh, foreign policy teams and also uh, the uh, economic team. These are the most important. I have uh, many other slides, talk about military team, talk about propaganda team, talk about uh, many other areas because Steve asked me to only spend 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I need to hurry up. Now, this is the foreign policy team, Wang Yi, uh, will be, um, you know, the, in charge of top diplomat. The four other people play an important role. Uh, according to my sources, that uh, uh, Qing, uh, uh, Qi Yu, also from Shanxi, currently party secretary of the foreign affairs, is not a really trained uh, professional diplomat. Uh, he will become state counselor. So Wang Yi's previous position will be divided, not the same person hold. Uh, Qi Yu will be the state counselor uh, on foreign affairs. and. Uh, uh, Liu Jianchao will, uh, will remain his current position, head of the, the International Liaison Department. Uh, Chen Gang, the current ambassador, is expected to be the foreign minister. The other person you probably, very few people heard of that, is uh, Liu Haixing. He highly likely will become uh, Taiban Zuren, the director of Taiwan Affairs, uh, replacing Liu Jiayi, right, who did not make uh, to the uh, Central Committee. Uh, Liu Haixing currently is the deputy office director of the National uh, the Security Council, China's National Security Council. Now, economic uh, team, if uh, indeed Ding Xuexiang is the executive vice premier, you will see Li Qiang, Ding Xuexiang, and He Lifeng play very, very important role. The next, next line is the second tier, is including Han Renxiu, will take some of the responsibility as the leading group office, a new office director of the 
Central Finance and Economic Commission office. Ying Yong, uh, previously Vice Governor of People's Bank of China, and uh, currently uh, 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 Deputy Party Secretary of, of Beijing, will succeed Yi Gang. Uh, he is a Harvard graduate, a very young, 1969. Right? And uh, the, the other person is Yi Hui Man, and uh, um, he will replace uh, Guo Su Qing, become uh, the chairman of the China Banking and the Insurance Regulation Commission. Again, these are not finalized, but very, very likely. Now, also, I want to mention there's uh, several uh, groups become in increasingly important. Uh, one of them is the uh, resurgence of technocrats. Now, uh, that um, in uh, 1997, when Jiang Zemin was in charge, technocrats reached a peak. The half of the power bureau members, the uh, central committee members, four member central committee, are uh, technocrats. Definition is you trained in uh, um, engineering in natural sciences. You practice as an engineer. You are in the leadership position. Now, financial technocrats are not included in this. And because they are not engineers or scientists by training, so we should make uh, a distinction between the real technocrats and the financial technocrats. This is for the real technocrats that the engineers or scientists turn politicians. Then decline largely because of Hu Jintao's people, Tuan Pai leaders, uh, then usually study you know party affairs and uh, uh, maybe economics uh, and law and uh, and history and uh, etc. So you see the job over the past. Uh, you know, uh, 15 years, but now rebound with Xi Jinping appointed a, a lot of uh, uh, new technocrats to important position over the past 10 years. Now return to the very important, uh, you know, uh, uh, significant size, you know, almost one third. Now, I particularly want to mention in this um, new technocrats, I wrote a paper called the Technocrats 2.0, differ from the uh, the previous technocrats, you just study civil engineering or double E, but this te the technocrats study about uh, uh, aerospace industrial and the biotechnology and uh, 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 you know uh, AI and etc. There are several AI experts, biotechnology experts in the Central Committee. Now these are the five people I call the leading figures for Cosmo Club. You can see that previously they served very very important position in the China's aerospace. Uh, it's a they are the commanding chief, a chief commander, deputy chief commander in the China's. Uh, you know, moon space engineering program, and uh, 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 you know, it's very it's real rock scientists. They they serve as rock scientists for twenty or twenty five. In some cases, even thirty years experience. Only recently moved to be the provincial uh, party secretary or governor for a relatively short period of time. So these are the people, and also some in the government as ministers. So two of them, uh, Ma Xinri and Yuan Jiajing, are the new power bureau member. Now, let me talk about some paradoxes. I want to be very fast. Now, Xi Jinping significantly diminished the, uh, the two major prince, uh, factions, princelings and the Tuan Pai. That's true. It's also uh, interesting to see he promoted many SOEs, especially from aerospace industry, to the Central Committee, even to the Power Bureau. Some of them uh, may have later served as a few years as top provincial leaders, like uh, uh, Ma Xinri in Guangdong and Xinjiang, and. Uh, and the Yuan Jiajing in Zhejiang, and uh, 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 Zhang Qingwei in Funan, and early on in Heilongjiang. Now, but uh, uh, interesting in the, uh, enough, when Xi Jinping defeated these two major factions, Prince and the Tuan Pai, the new factions, of course, will emerge. And uh, you cannot uh, end that. It's just like Chairman Mao said, that there was always uh, factional politics. It's already uh, become evident that the, some of the infightings in uh, powerful Zhejiang Gan start to emerge. Now they may be disappearing, but uh, in the coming years, you will see uh, that faction itself become a very, very dynamic. And uh, uh, then of course, there's a new faction where the cosmoprod uh, curve people will form a faction we yet to see, right? And also very interesting that uh, Steve know that uh, when uh, I wrote uh, the middle class Shanghai book, I mentioned about the Shanghai leaders will become very prominent in Xi Jinping's uh, it's the third term, which I actually proved to be right. I will show uh, one slide later on. Now, another interesting thing is you, you pe most of people, the international um, uh, market and also Chinese domestic uh, public intellectuals or entrepreneurs did not have a very positive reaction for the leadership lineup. But uh, um, particularly the standing committee, they think that uh, uh, either their educational background, their uh, experience, but uh, the, on the other hand, uh, many of them have, uh, this is the previous position just before the party Congress, where they are located. 
bigger picture is the power bureau standing committee, small picture is power bureau member. Many of them work in the coastal region from Guangdong, Fujian, Zhejiang, and Shanghai, and also uh, 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 Shandong and, uh, and Beijing. And these are the coastal re regions, so very few in the inland region. Those in the inland region also previously advanced their career, like uh, 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 you know, uh, Ma Xinri in Xinjiang, previous advanced career in Guangdong, and uh, Chen Minar spent most of time early on in Zhejiang. So it's really uh, in that area, as we know, it's market friendly, more cosmopolitan, especially Guangdong and Shanghai. So that may lift some confidence uh, for the business community. And um, it's just like I said earlier on, some of the business entrepreneurs think Li Chang actually is a good choice, right? And uh, um, so that's the background. Now, another interesting thing is that Steve, we are always interested is the foreign educated retainees. Despite the de deterioration of US China relations, this time actually have more foreign educated retainees. And uh, they most of them studied um, in the United States and the West except that Yin Li also studied in Russia, but he's the only exception probably in civilian leadership. I mean, 102 in the 376 studied in Russia, but he also was a visiting scholar at the Harvard Public Health uh, uh, School. Now, uh, Wang Yi studied the West, he worked for West in, in countries for a long time. Li Ganji is the international renowned nuclear expert. Chen Jinning spent 10 years in England and uh, including five or six years um, as a PhD and a postdoc at the Imperial College. And uh, Yuan Jiajing studied two years in the German space program. But actually these are not including some short-term uh, studies in like uh, Harvard, There's, there are a few in the New Power Bureau, like uh, uh, Zhang Guoqing and uh, uh, Li Hongzhong, uh, uh, they, they serve as a short-term. The definition of the retainees is you at least study overseas for one year or longer as a degree candidate. That's a, that's the definition. So it's also fascinating to see some of the contrast between the education background in the standing committee and the educational background overall in the power bureau. And it's, it, they, most of them have solid and PhD had also studied full time and they are the well-respected scientists. So that's fascinating to see this kind of uh, you know, tensions or dynamics. And also retainees, the number is to continue to maintain about 20%, which means that uh, in 376 uh, member of the Central Committee, one out of five uh, retainees, uh, uh, particularly this time four members even higher. Now, last slide, last slide, priority. What these appointments reflect Xi Jinping's overall goal? I think I just want to be very brief. Uh, Xi Jinping's emphasis is not so much a market reform, not so much about uh, you know, economic growth. His top priority is national security, is uh, social political stability. And uh, in terms of economic policy, it's more continuity than change. The way that the, he, the effort to promote more technocrats, including aerospace uh, you know, rock scientists, it's reflected that he's uh, talking about technological innovation, indigenous innovation. So I talk about the technological ingenuity. Now, I would be happy to answer any other questions about the implication for US-China relations, but uh, these paradoxes and the priorities talk about uh, the changes, the changes directions or continuity compared with the two or three years ago. I think a common prosperity is the major theme and also they will play tough on the United States despite the, the fact that a lot of uh, power bureau members are US or Western trained. Now, because in Xi Jinping's view, international environment change China should stay with its own course, with so-called China's own modernization uh, path. Now, so that's it, over. Now, uh, I'm sorry I did not have the, uh, the, uh, the slides about Shanghai. This is the first time in history there are five standing, Harvard standing committee members, uh, either born in Shanghai, like Wang Funing and Ding Xuexiang, or work substantially in Shanghai, like Li Chang and, uh, and uh, Li Xi, and also briefly, in Xi Jinping's case. So that's actually talk about Shanghai, despite the COVID situation, despite some of the things, you know, um, I think Shanghai's developer may, may be, um, you know, uh, it's an exception and norm, but the Chinese leaders continue to uh, advance their career from coastal region, from Shanghai, from Guangdong. And uh, this may send some positive message. Over, Steve.
Chung, that is remarkably comprehensive in a very short period of time. That that is spectacular. The um, I noticed a drop in the number of uh, Central Committee members who have studied abroad. You uh, you know that's my favorite statistic of all. Yeah. Um, what's going on here? Uh, a drop in the Central Committee actually is equal to the last time. It's twenty percent. Two percent lower, according to uh, your no report. zero no 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 no. No, let me go back. I'm sorry. That, that, it's a, no, right, it's the I, same. I was looking at it quickly. Yeah, it's the same. It's the largest same. Oh, wait, so actually. it's remained the same. Uh, it's it's twenty percent. It's a limit. But it's not increased. Been, not increased. Yeah, it's a. It's only four members increase compared last time, and but the power bureau increased from four to six, maybe even. I mean, the things is Steve. Sometimes the Chinese leaders, their bios is fascinating, and the uh, uh, previous ten years ago or. 20 years ago, people loved to put their foreign education on the resume, but now some leaders are hesitant to put on the resume. So it could be even one more person actually study overseas for more than one year or longer in the, in the in, in this case, also in the West. So again, from four to se six or seven, it's an increased power bureau. The, um, to me, the greatest shock was the non-inclusion of any women in the oh, public yeah. bureau. I, I was first the, when I first looked at it, I thought I I missed it, but they put an F next to you know the female for, for anybody who's a woman. It's shocking. What's the message here? What is the leadership thinking? Uh, the symbolism of it, the importance of it is is quite stunning. You, you can see they're not sensitive for the Chinese Chinese women and they're not sensitive to international community. And uh, as, uh, actually, actually, the funny thing is that a few years ago, I wrote an article talking about the three places in so-called Great China, two led by women, you know. And uh, so, uh, uh, um, but uh, that's it's a really complete, you know, lack of sensitivity and the lack of the need to join the international community to have the more gender balance. And, uh, uh, but also tell, uh, show that uh, China think that the identity politics is not is something the West and probably lead to the wrong direction. Of course, that's subtle. And, uh, but uh, I think most importantly in this case, uh, that the lineup, they, they do not really pro provide the chance for women to locate them in good positions, then eventually as them prepare to further promotion. There's only one candidate, it's uh, Chen Yiqing. I, th I thought that he would make it. But his weaknesses, she only served as a great zone, never been in other places. But that's not her fault. It's that the organizing department or other things. And uh, so I think what's going on is the things, the various things, not one single one. Uh, but that's actually quite revealing. So I put it as my first surprise. Yeah, it was it was it was stunning. And I was talking with highly educated women in China. And, and their disappointment, they did, yeah. you know, on WeChat, there was no hesitation in saying yeah. this is really a bad symbol. Um, and it, to me, was, was again, I thought it was a typo. I, I thought I just missed reading it, but it, it turned out to be the case. It was a bad day for anybody named Hu. Talk about what <laughs> happened to Hu Chenhua, uh, Hu Chenhua and to uh, Hu Jintao. First, Hu Chenhua. You know, I expected him to at least stay on the Politburo. Well, um, you know, first of all, I do not know. And I think there's a two different version at the moment. One said that uh, he will, he actually asked, uh, you know, step down with a protest or whatever. And uh, uh, if you do not put him in the Power Bureau, you must have some reason. And I do not, uh, there's no uh, current uh, in the official reason. But the other things could be um, uh, that, um, you know, uh, uh, Xi Jinping think nevertheless still a threat. And uh, uh, to a certain extent that uh, uh, the things has changed previously, that uh, the team of rivals to not winners take all, uh, Steve, yeah. at least for a moment. So that kind of things that are uh, predominant. So uh, to answer your question, first of all, I still do not know, no sufficient information, right? But uh, I think that we'll, we'll hear more uh, in the next few uh, uh, months. Now, the other version is said that he will be the United Front director without a seat in the secretary, but with a seat at the vice chairman of CPCC. Now, again, this is a, a 
kind of semi-official uh, spread. I do not know whether it's true or not, but it's recent things. So I do not know. So I think that within a, a few days or a few weeks, we will have better uh, information on that. Now for Hu Jintao, I, I don't know, of course that uh, you know, different people have the re uh, different reading. Um, I actually was suspicious that uh, he just fighting to see the information. People just cover the information for him. I mean, come on, his son was in delegate and he himself must be informed about what's going on and the things. But I think that uh, it's uh, the whole thing is the two who things are linked together. You know, so making people to think about that. I, I also, um, uh, again, that he certainly disappoint, but whether he has some uh, health issues or not, this is official Chinese official account. Uh, so I do not have the answer, but the things is two whose issues linked together and uh, certainly make people have a lot of imagination, a lot of uh, suspicion and et cetera. I understandable, I understand that. But uh, it, it is, I said early on, it is a PR disaster, public relation that, uh, that uh, but I, I hope that we need to know more information and also the way the handle should be much, much better in the future. But uh, for your question, again, I do not, I wish I can uh, give you the concrete answer, but I do not want to spread the rumor so far that uh, it's a, it's a, it's a really that um, I hope that Chinese uh, official sources will give us more information, whether the international community or Chinese public can accept or not. Uh, I don't know, but this is certainly will be one of the, the most Chinese, memorable. Had the Chinese government ever acknowledged that he had Parkinson's? Was that well, ever Well, they officially... did not say, they, they, they did not say that things. They did, Xinhua did say, he is physically, uh, no, he is a uh, uh, has health problem, and uh, 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 that's the official interpretation. This is recently. The previously, usually they were not to release too much information for the leaders. This is again, this is completely uh, different from uh, still for uh, US, United States that the uh, uh, president and um, you know vice president should require to release. But no, I mean Chinese yeah. think that the area they don't want to tell the public. Yeah, I mean just one other point on that. I remember at the seventieth. Uh, anniversary of the founding of the PRC. He was on the podium and you could see his hand. Yeah. The cameras, they, yeah. You could see his hand shaking in a classic symptom of Parkinson's. Yeah. I had a family yeah. member who died from complications yeah. of Parkinson's yeah. and his look yeah. and his action seemed to me consistent with Parkinson's and somehow yeah. I think they were able to yeah. monitor him remotely and they saw yeah. some yeah. things which were about to happen, but it's hard to know. Um, yeah. Qinggang's elevation to the Central Committee. Have we ever had an ambassador to the United States who has been a member at the time he was ambassador of the uh, Central Committee? Uh, Yang Jiexi uh, was an alternate. Yang Jiexi was an alternate member, but Qinggang is a full member. And uh, so uh, that's actually it's quite remarkable. And what are the implications for kind of U.S.-China relations? I guess you put him down as a possible foreign minister. He would be a yeah. very young foreign minister. Well, that's uh, his rise to that position attributed to Xi Jinping's personal, you know, relations. And uh, certainly, this is the same things uh, with some other appointment. Xi Jinping wants to have to his trusted people, and also create some um, opportunity for these people to advance. And uh, in a way, it's good because it's uh, uh, to show that the China still pay made more attention to US-China relations as an ambassador who in short period of time start to know America. And uh, of course, that the whole environment at the moment is quite critical of the United States. You cannot find, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's a very soft spoken or other kinds of things. It's, this is also very much in line. So I think that um, from Chinese perspective, it's a, a good choice. And also he's remarkably young. He could uh, be in play in a more important position um, in the future. But uh, again, uh, it's not a secret that he has a strong ties with Xi Jinping when he was appointed with ambassador that also, you know that, that uh, that's the reason that actually could be good. We do not need to go through the several steps then can communicate. Now, so he has a position, it's a challenging job. And uh, we certainly wish him the best. Yeah. So what are the implications, not of necessarily his appointment to the Central Committee, but of the entire Politburo Standing Committee appointments for U.S.-China relations? You touched well, on you can in, see. Your, in your presentation, yeah. didn't go sure, into you can see. Sure, you can see um, 
uh, uh, China think that uh, Xi Jinping talk about it all the time, talk about new international environment, talk about the risk uh, in his perception that the uh, uh, United States want to put China down. Um, uh, so that's the narrative uh, that uh, it's to a certain extent, this is uh, uh, backed by the, the, the things like the national security report or other things. We identify China as the, the most important, the most formidable rival, or even some uh, people said the most formidable enemy. So China need to react. So you, the people, you will see that in the military, in foreign affairs, in propaganda, I'm sorry, I did not get a chance to talk about propaganda. This is actually even better if you look at that team. It reflects that the uh, uh, wolf warrior spirit, the doujin in fighting. So that's the that's the message, right? But at the same time, Xi Jinping also positioned some of the leaders, um, like uh, uh, Li Chang and Cai Qi. Actually, many people from Zhejiang and Fujian and Zhejiang and Shanghai they are very familiar with Taiwan, Taiwanese, Taiwan affairs. Many of them early career they. They visit Taiwan, and some of the relatives, uh, I was told that the Tsai Chi's relatives also live in Taiwan. So they are uh, also more sensible in this area. So it's a mix because the economic team is also foreign policy team in that regard. And also some of the power standing community will always be involved. So I would say Xi Jinping position himself in a way he can go to two different directions. But I think the fact that the US-China relation is not in good shape, uh, it's continued to deteriorate. But the both sides also, from the time to time, we do not want to go to completely out of control. It's not a free fall, but it's a downward, I mean, kind of a, uh, spiral. But it, because downward spiral, there's always opportunity, including um, the leader summit. Probably this will happen in, in, in November. In Jinping. I think this will chance that the Xi Jinping will tell more about uh, how leadership uh, uh, to know what, I mean, how China's stability can contribute to the global economy. And uh, this is, of course, for his language for G20. And uh, no, he will argue, you can imagine from this kind of message, China play card for security and uh, stability and et cetera. Now, of course, to a certain extent that China is not the only country put uh, security and politics above the econo uh, e economy. The, the challenge, the question is whether China can maintain Good economic growth, whether in the next few months, well, particularly with COVID, uh, I heard that there's a lot of discussion to ease the COVID draconian uh, nature of COVID situation. So, if that's uh, the case, that certainly will uh, have some impact for business, both domestically and internationally. So, again, Xi Jinping will play around in that regard. The Markets, the foreign investors in China, portfolio investors, voted with their money at the end of the uh, uh, at the end of the, the meeting and withdrew enormous amounts of capital from China. And the market had what I think the South China Morning Post said an epic drop. You seem to you implied a disagreement with that. Yeah. That in no. fact that the standing committee is more competent. One of the issues, so kind of that's one part of the question. The other part is there were folks who pointed out that that many of the standing committee members entered university as no mingong, you know, the the I don't even know. Gong Long Bing Shui Yan. Gong Yeah, Gong Long Bing Shui Yan. And and that's not generally looked upon yeah. favorably. So how do you deal with no. those issues? Yeah, now, so, so I think that what you mean is the Power Bureau is more capable, well educated with PhDs, foreign education. Power Bureau Standing Committee is with the uh, graduates of the working, Gong Long Bing Shui and worker, peasant, soldier class. I make sure that the, you, are, you and I are on the same page, right? Yes, yeah. correct. So that's attention. That's attention. Yeah, this is exactly and what And that's I what said. foreign investors and, pointed to in part. That's right. That's right. That's right. But uh, uh, yeah, in a way that uh, people did not talk about uh, Tai Chi and, uh, uh, and uh, Li Chang actually in terms of business things that uh, of course they, they, these two are yes men. And, um, but on the other hand, they are market friendly in uh, their previous uh, work experience and, uh, and, and et cetera. Now, my point is Xi Jinping certainly currently emphasize stability, emphasize that uh, China, because of the consolidation of power, he believes it's good for policy continuity, stability, and the national security. So that message at the moment, um, certainly already 
uh, well received by general public, but are probably criticized by intellectuals and some of the some of the uh, you know local officials. This is my assessment without the solid evidence. But uh, his plan is that uh, you know no um, companies, no group, no entrepreneurs want to invest in a in a country in a region with chaotic with uh, deterioration with a lot of risk. So China, even under the you know authoritarian kind of system, you know, it's a kind of control, provide the stability, provide the continuity, provide the order, even this is highly controlled. Now, whether he will have a point, it's far too early to say. I expect that the early reaction will be negative. It is negative. But the three months, six months down the road, whether change uh, or not, I believe that probably will change. Mm -hmm. Ken Jarrett asks, for those who have been in staff support positions for C, like Li Chang and Ding Xuexiang, how likely is it that they will be able to step out of that kind of role in their new positions? Will they just be executors of policy versus shapers of policy? Will the state council be weakened as an institution? Well, uh, state council was weakened all the time. I mean, Xi Jinping, the previous 10 years, it's, a, it's not a, like a uh, uh, Zhang Zemin, Zhu Rongji, Wu Fu Jintao, Wen Jiabao, that kind of things. The, the structure profoundly changed. Now, the issue is that, uh, you know, uh, that's true, Li Chang and uh, the Ding Xuexiang, they are all Mi Su for Xi Jinping, uh, Mi Su Zhang, uh, the, 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 the kind of chief of staff for a while. Now, that's actually will receive a lot of criticism because you need to have a leaders that uh, you know, it's more through their own, your own way and become a, a real um, economic administrator. But uh, that's actually is a case of Li Chang. Now, Ding Xuexiang probably lack this kind of experience. Now, no matter what, these two leaders will work under Xi Jinping's, um, you know, direction. There's no question about that. So unlike Liu He early on, Liu He sometimes is a leader will say no, uh, it's quite open, although he, uh, and uh, his relation with Xi Jinping is very solid. But uh, on the other hand, I constantly emphasize when you defeat the old major factions, new faction will emerge. So it's not a really completely absolute power, like someone said, because the Chinese system has its own dynamic and Mao Zedong, I mean, he, he himself acknowledged that. Of course, it's ironic that Mao Zedong mentioned that, but that's true. Sometimes you will feel a lot of resistance now, Steve, I just want to mention to you, until a couple of years ago, Xi Jinping could not control the police. Until just a couple of years ago, he appointed his longtime friend, Wang Xiaohong, to be the police chief. That tells us a lot. That may explain why he wanted to continue to uh, uh, consult his power, do not give any chance for the possible you know, challenge uh, at the moment. But the irony is uh, the, every system has its own way, faction, no matter what, will start to emerge. So I think in the next five years or longer, he needs to address the issue about the political succession and how to address that. I mean, we still yet to see, but the, the way I hope that I explain myself clear that the way that the Li Chang and the Ding Xuexiang both in the state council rather than different organization, it is a fascinating arrangement. You know, to to no one talk about successor. That's the actual arrangement. I always try to figure out how she can deal with that issue. On the one hand, you have to have some younger leaders, but uh, how to avoid them be identified immediately by successor. But I never thought that's the case. So that's uh, that's what happened now. You think that the two youngest members of the standing committee, if something happened, they would be prepared to be successors? No. No, no, there's no clear sign. I mean, no clear sign. And, uh, except, uh, and, uh, except their age. Well, <laughs> uh, that's true. But in, I, I actually think that it will be much broader, even may not be necessarily part of the standing committee. I think we should look at the bigger pool uh, uh, again. I mean, it's not a given. It's certainly not a clear. Uh, uh, you do need to clearly have the line up like previously you designated as vice president, vice president of the CMC, and uh, you should put uh, the person in different position. At least uh, you should put them in charge of party affairs because party rules the country, right? 
So that's the message. So for the state council, um, I don't think that the message is that clear. Actually, it's deliberately to be ambiguous. Yeah. Bob Peterzak asks about what the implications of these appointments for Taiwan affairs. Uh, are we going to see increasing coercion, potential military yeah. action? Both directions. It's an excellent question because, uh, you know, uh, on the one hand, the military officer's appointment to MEP clearly uh, is targeting Taiwan, give more pressure, right? Although Zhang Yuxia also has a mixed messages because he actually uh, 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 has some uh, uh, occasions to talk about that uh, we should be uh, very disciplined, we should not do something, you know, unprepared and etc. This could be interpreted as more thoughtful and uh, less kind of provocative. But uh, uh, He Weidong certainly is a uh, message to Taiwan. But on the other hand, as I mentioned, that uh, that the, some of the people working in Zhejiang and by nature and Fujian, because of the geographical location, these people, relatively speaking, far more uh, kind of uh, knowledgeable about Taiwan, not like some of the imperial provinces. And uh, also uh, uh, Taiwanese, particularly Taiwanese business people, actually work with these two leaders, Tai Chi uh, and uh, Li Chang, and also with some other other uh, Zhejiang people. There are so many Zhejiang people now in that in that regard. So I think it's a it's a two deliberately uh, seemingly contradictory, or I use the term paradoxical arrangement. Two can go to different uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, position uh, direction. It's a soft and hard. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, understandable. But overall, Steve, uh, I think it become much tougher. And uh, yeah. but uh, tougher does not mean necessarily you will use force. And uh, uh, we do need to make a distinction. So one thing is good about the the party congress actually is that they, they did not have, as some people expected, with a timetable of Taiwan. I think this would be a disaster. But uh, certainly, the uh, they enhanced the language, but did not have the timetable. Yeah, that's and of, actually course, and of course yeah. it depends upon what the United States does. That U.S. Absolutely. policy, yeah. U.S. Absolutely. policy towards Taiwan and towards the mainland <laughs> has an enormous effect. We always see it. A lot of people in the United States see it as China making decisions in a vacuum. It's actually very well, much. Responsible. Steve, you're absolutely right. I want to add one thing that the Xi Jinping the narrative is China is forced to go that direction because the international environment change. You need to prepare this kind of scenario. China's uh, the, the twin circulation may be emphasized on the domestic circulation. It's also forced by the decouple, by trade war, and by you know technological competition, etc. This Chinese narrative. So that explains his appointment and his policy direction. So I, I do see that the, the, the shift, shift not this, this party congress, shift a few years ago in terms of common prosperity, poverty reduction, and, uh, and etc. And uh, even you can say from day one, Xi Jinping talked about Chinese dream is emphasized at, uh, to enhance the middle income group or middle class. You've written about China's middle class. How has China's middle class responded to these appointments? Do we I, know? I do not know. I do not. This is a fascinating question. I, I do not have reliable information. I think uh, certainly they happy to see the five leaders are from Shanghai who have some ties with Shanghai. and. Uh, that's unprecedented, you know, uh, and uh, 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 one thing. Secondly, um, that's uh, some of the leaders that, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, they probably uh, will be uh, confused and uh, the, the, uh, the chance appointment on one hand that uh, most people in Shanghai are very critical uh, about that. But on the other hand, uh, that the leader actually knows Shanghai and uh, the economic development, including some of the the business deal, gigantic project, they think it's not bad. So I think they may have the mixed feeling. So important things is the next, uh, next couple of years that Li Chang can deliver some good things to uh, to damage control about the, 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 the coronavirus in, in Shanghai's case. But uh, in other parts of the country, maybe think, some people think that uh, the COVID, especially the political establishment, Xi Jinping, do not think that the, uh, uh, the Shanghai lockdown is a, is a problem. It's a failure. They think it's a success. It's still the nation. Let me end with one question. We're out of time, so let me end with one question. We're hoping that President Xi and President Biden will meet in Bali in a few weeks. 
uh, you have 60 seconds to brief President Biden about the events that have occurred in China, you know, the, the appointment of the Standing Committee and the, and the Politburo and President Xi's putting uh, many of his protégés in power. What do you tell him? Well, so first of all, that uh, uh, that reflects the different values of the two systems and the different mechanisms of the two systems. But uh, in the near foreseeable, in the foreseeable future, Xi Jinping probably will be with us, and uh, his consolidation of power will be with us for uh, a while. So in that case, we do need to continue to engage with China, and uh, uh, also sometimes that. Uh, 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 a strong leader may serve one function. If he want to control some kind of silly behavior of the military, he may be able to do that. Now, of course, uh, overall, uh, American democracy certainly do not uh, do not uh, see that kind of monopolized power. But on the other hand, that uh, ultimately, uh, Chinese will decide the country's trajectory, Chinese political system. So I think continuing to engage with China is our top strategy. We should uh, look at what's going on in China. Sometimes if we single-minded, you know, criticize Chinese system, Chinese leader will be counterproductive. It does not mean we should not talk about the American values, American, uh, you know, these kind of things, but they should do it in a sensitive way. Now, one of the things that in the past few years, Xi Jinping actually used American anti-China rhetoric to gain a lot of support because also from China's history, whoever um, a leader to, so, uh, to hold the, the national a kind of a nationalistic flag will win. That's repeatedly happened in China. Chung, I can't thank you enough for this. This has been at a time when there's so much kind of speculation. <laughs> you have provided hard data on what has occurred in China and how we should think about it. It has been absolutely fabulous. I thank you for helping us educate the American people on what's going on in China. Thank you so much, Chung, and thank the audience for joining us. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for staying up late Bye. in Singapore. Yeah, sure. <laughs>